If you have an unquenchable thirst to crush your bucket list, relentlessly pursue your dreams, and live life on your own terms, then turn up the volume and tune in. You're now listening to Zeph and Moses Blacksburg on the Year of Purpose podcast. This episode of the Year of Purpose is brought to you by our brand new book, Life Rescripted. Find your purpose and design your dream life before the curtains close. If you want to be the first in line to receive a free digital copy from me, all you have to do is head on over to www.liferescriptedbook.com to find out more. Hello, everyone. This is Zephan Blacksburg, and today I am joined by Daphna Michelson Genet, and she is the founder and journeywoman behind the 50 in 52 journey, in which she traveled to all 50 United States and Washington, D.C. within 52 weeks of one year to find, highlight, and elevate extraordinary people doing extraordinary things, solving problems, and building community. She's been featured as a TEDx speaker, is president and founder of the Journey Institute and works with small business owners, entrepreneurs, and educational faculties to strengthen the core operations of their business settings through motivating their human talent. Daphna utilizes systems she developed following her travels to all 50 states to find the secrets accomplished uh, problem solvers used to create success in workplace and community. And she's here with me today. What's going on? Hi, hey. lots of good stuff. <laughs> yeah, so I love your story because anything that involves travel and just learning more about, you know, where we are, our community and, and kind of finding those hidden gems uh, always inspires me. As many people who listen to the podcast know, you know, the podcast was motivated out of my trip around the country over the course of two months, first flying for 30 days and second, a nine day, 3000 mile road trip. So I love Anything that is inspired by, you know, exploring everything around us. So I have I to think I need to hear your story more than you need to hear mine. <laughs> well, I have to ask, like, how what led you to, to do that? Because I know, you know, for me, there were a lot of transformational moments. And, you know, it, it started with a decision to, to leave my job and I started a business and then the business wasn't as fulfilling. So I wanted to find more. So that's kind of what led me to the travel and, and to do something different. Uh, but I'm curious to hear from from you, you know, where were you working and what were you doing before this? Well, I, I think my story is a little bit um, less organized and well thought out than yours. Uh, the, the idea to quit my job and do all of this travel was really stemmed by a conversation I had with my boyfriend of what I would do if I won the lottery. Oh, I apologize. I don't know if that, <laughs> okay. that truck is too noisy. I really, it's, it's a gorgeous day out here in Colorado and um, I couldn't resist being outside. So um, we were in the grocery store and he needed to break a 20 and I was this single mom, two kids, mortgage and tuition and somehow conned this guy into dating me. <laughs> and so we're in the grocery store and he says, oh, I got to break a 20 and the lottery is at like 450 million. I'm going to go buy a ticket. And I was standing there thinking, okay, I need to not have my, I don't play the lottery because my parents were very poor and they always lost lottery. I, I need to not have that meltdown right here because then I'm going to lose the boyfriend. And, you know, I'm weighing, I'm like, okay, fine. You go ahead and buy that lottery ticket and I'll pray for you. And I think, you know, like it's off. It's not on me. It's, it's like his thing. So we get in the car and he's like, okay, what are you going to do when we win the lottery? And I'm like, oh my God, I can't play this game. I can't play this game. I play, can't play this game. And he's like, yes, you can play the stupid game. I'm like, okay. And I outfit my Porsche Cayenne hybrid because I care about the environment. And then he says, okay, well, would you travel? And I said, you better believe I'm going to travel and I'm going to go to all 50 states and I'm going to meet with every governor and I'm going to ask them what they're doing to engage their citizens in solving community problems. Just like that. And he's just kind of looking at me because we all know what the right answer was. Fiji, we're going to go to Fiji. And that's not what came out of my mouth. And for three hours, I could not stop talking about why we needed to talk to ordinary people and that the people who were in office were not the only people who could solve the problems and that they needed to be reaching out to their community and they needed to know what were solutions that they could get behind and how could the community members tell you what the problem were and I'm like, blah, 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 three hours. Wow. And, um, and he bought the wrong lottery ticket. <laughs> and to, you know, to, to make up for that egregious error, I made him marry me. 
But in the in the interim, I said to him, you know, I think I need to do this anyway. I was so hook, line and sinker bought in on this idea. And at the time, I had just completed a program called Leadership Denver, which m- many cities have a leadership whatever. Ours is tied with our Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce. And we had spent an entire year together studying how problems were solved in the city and county of Denver. And it was late 2008, and we were going to be the house of the Democratic National Convention. So no matter what party you were, all anybody was talking about was the election. And people who I admired, who I believed were problem solvers, were saying, you know, I can't wait until somebody gets into the office and starts solving some problems around here. And I was like, wait a minute, isn't that what we signed up for? Isn't it our job to be solving some problems around here? And if we, who are the problem solvers, are waiting for somebody else to solve our problems, what's happening to the rest of society? And there was this feeling that we were giving up our power to this whomever was going to solve some problems around here. And I felt like, you know, after going through this conversation with, with, we'll give him a name, Michael, um, after going through this conversation with Michael, that if I could go out, and, and ultimately it wasn't the governors, it was the ordinary people who were solving problems in their communities. If I could go out and find these people, and if I could show you that no matter what you looked like or sounded like, or how much money or education you had, that you could solve a problem in your community, that I could give people back their power. And it became this incredible mission and calling and I don't know, whatever language you want to do. Um, We like the word crazy, uh, nuts, insane, but I had to do it. And um, I started that next day calling my mentors together and saying, hey, you know, so here's this thing that I want to do. And what do you think? Um, I'm going to go to all 50 states and I'm going to find these people. And They would just kind of look at me and they would say, you're nuts, you're crazy, you're out of your mind, but you have to do this. And so on one hand, they were like, hold on, you know, check, keep your day job. And on the other side, they're like, oh, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. You know, I double dog dare you. And then I had to do it. Very cool. So I love that. Uh, when you discovered this, it was really one of those things that it sounds like it was something you had given thought to before you were even asked, you know, if you win the lottery, what are you going to do? And you just kind of ran with the gut and the intuition there. And that, that's a huge thing that's really changed my life just in the last two years has been when I stick to the things that I know deep inside I have to do. Uh, it works out 10 times better. As scary as it is, you know, as, as fearful as I might be for uh, what could come out of it. Uh, it always leads to something even better. And I think that that's something that so many people have lost sight of today is is listening into uh, what they already feel driven to do or what they feel like they're supposed to do. And they settle for, you know, the cubicle life or the corporate life or, you know, maybe even they settle for owning their own business that they dislike. You yeah, know, I, it, I talk about that with people all the time. Just because you're good at something doesn't mean you should be doing it. Um, I look at lawyers, accountants who are really good at their work and hate their jobs. And when when you talk about how I answered that question and then kind of went after it, to me, I boil it down to living my authenticity. I, I authentically felt the need to do this and had to go after it. And if people would pay attention to themselves like you did in, in your travels and say, okay, I know that there is something that is part of me that authentically I need to go after and then do it, what does this world look like? Yeah. Well, so let me pick on the accountant for a second here. Let's just say we've got a guy who loves crunching the numbers, uh, really uh, just he's good at it. But wait, let me rephrase. He's good at it, but he doesn't love it. Mm. it. Where where do you go from there to figure out what comes next? Because I feel like that's where a lot of the people, at least in my age range, if not e- even uh, throughout all the age ranges, are kind of stuck. I know a lot of people that are in their their mid to late 20s, if not early 30s. And it's like, I went to college for this one skill set, I developed it and honed it in. And now I would consider myself an expert at it. But I'm not happy. (laughs) So like, what is it that's missing? And and where do you go to figure out what comes next so that you don't stay stagnant? Well, I ask people every time I talk, 
and before I start, so I don't kind of give them a clue as to where this might be going, but I ask them to write down three things that they've complained about in the last week. Top three things. And, you know, if you're having trouble, the first three that come to your mind, if you're not having trouble, the three things that you see coming up over and over and over again, and you're complaining about those things over and over and over again. And I ask people to write it down. And then I ask them, you know, I tell them my story. And the people that I met all had to answer one important question. What do you think that question is? Uh, what makes you happy? They had to answer the question, what's in it for me? Ah. When I first wrote my book, I had wanted to title it, What's in it for me? But I thought, you know what? Well, I didn't think. I was told over and over again, nobody's buying a book titled, What's in it for me? But what I learned from interviewing, I interviewed 500 people around this country, and they were all people who were solving a problem or doing something or living their authenticity or living their passion that was in some way, shape, or form helping another. It starts with understanding that you're facing something and that you don't like it and that you're going to fix it. And you're not going to wait for somebody to ask you. And you're not going to ask for permission. And you're not going to wait for that one more degree. Or you're not going to wait for that one more dollar in your paycheck. But that you're going to go out and say, okay, I have a problem. You might have that problem too. And I'm going to solve it for both of us. So what does that lead to? And we can, oh, this is just terrible. I'm so sorry. Oh, you're fine. The, the oh. earbuds help a lot. I can hear you pretty clearly. Okay, good. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, audience. <laughs> um, so when you, when you think about that element of what's in it for me, you know, I go back to the people that I interviewed and one of the guys, no joke, had been in the military. And when he was in the military, they didn't have good razors when he was out in the field. And so he came up with a razor that was good for the field. And then he worked on ways to get that out there, finding grants and this that and the other thing. Why? Because he had a problem. And we always say, I didn't make it up. Necessity is the mother of invention. But if we boil it down to, you don't need to be an inventor. You simply need to be able to listen to yourself and say, okay, I'm facing something. I'm, uh, there is something that's just not working and I'm the person to solve it. And I don't need somebody to ask me or tell me to do it. I'm the person to do it. And I think that that's that first step to identifying, okay, I can find what makes me happy. And here's the thing. Let's say you're a really good accountant or you're really good at business or you're really good at law. How are the ways that your talents and skills play into solving that problem? problem or creating that opportunity. So you don't need to put all of these expertise that you, that you have been developing over the years into a drawer. They all play into you living your authenticity and your passion. And it simply starts by making a list. So I'd have to say that this is very much in alignment with what I did. You know, I ran a video production company. I still do. Uh, and But for a long time, that was the only thing that I did. And it took that travel around the country to realize I'm extremely good at this. I don't have the same passion that I used to for it. So clearly there's there's something here. There there has to be some part of shooting a video that I that I do love that that keeps me doing this. And what I found was it's the storytelling. I'm a storyteller. I give details that paint, you know, vivid pictures in people's minds of where I've been and what I've done and and what it felt like to be there. And so once I found out that storytelling was was really the passion and video was more of my best communicator for getting it out there. Right. It was your medium. That's when it clicked. Yeah. So it, it's it's very interesting to hear that. And I think that you are 100 percent correct in in that figuring out. Uh, what about those things it has kept you there for so long? Because there's something there underneath of it all. Uh, it's just a matter of asking a better question. That's right. And, and when, you ask, when you say it that way, um, so my husband has a book called Ask the Questions to Empower Your Life. And our whole world is about asking better questions. And when he asked me what I would do if I won the lottery, that was the question I needed to hear to be able to come to the point where I understood what I needed to do. And I don't know that that's the question for everybody, although we have a fun workshop that's all around that question. Um, but ultimately it is, as you said, what are the questions we're asking ourselves? And not to, I mean, you could interview Michael. I, like, he can tell you this story. But, but his, whole, his whole premise is we can ask ourselves questions that move, move the needle forward or we can ask ourselves questions that keep us stagnant. We make the choice. 
and we have the capacity to make that choice. And really, it's, it was his guidance. And I talked about um, in my book and on my travels that the people who were successful all had a cheerleader. And he was my cheerleader. And he was the one, there was a, a point, and, and I don't know if you faced this in your travels, but there was a point where I ran stone cold out of money. And uh, I was about 25 states in, so, you know, half, at the halfway mark, there was not one penny left. And I wrote a letter of resignation, if you will, to my board. And I said to them, okay, you know, I failed. You know, and, and, and I captured 250 stories. And there's still a lot of good work I think that we can do based on these stories. But I'm not going to make it to all 50 states. And I sent him the draft of the letter to review. And um, he sends me a text message back. And he says, not yet. We're not done yet. And I came back to his house. You know, I was at the playground across the street with my kids. And I walked back into his house and he said, I'm sorry, we don't quit. And he had an opportunity in that moment, right? I became this very expensive girlfriend all of a sudden, you know? And he had an opportunity in that moment to say, yeah, you know what? You did a really good job. I'm, I'm proud of you for getting to 25 states. That's a, that's a really big deal. Most people won't get to 25 states in their life. And that's, that's a really big deal that you just did. And, and yeah, let's call the hospital and see if you can get your job back. But he didn't do that. He said, you're doing something important here. I believe in you. I'll do whatever it takes to help you and we'll get back on the phone and we'll call some more people. You know, it was 2009. It was a really hard time to raise money. Um, but we'll get back on the phone and we'll call some people and we'll, we'll make this happen. You're not in this alone. And so I, I tell people when they're going out on the limb, when they wake up in the morning and, you know, some people will say God spoke to them. Others will say the universe has delivered. Others, I don't care what language you use. I really don't. It's, it's different for each of you, for each of us. But when we wake up in the morning and all of a sudden our belly is on fire, we have a passion we have a desire. We have a need for something to do. Recognize that lots of people are going to tell you you're nuts. They're going to, they're going to walk away from you, but the cheerleaders are going to stay right there with you. And they're not yes men. They're not people who are going to say, yes, absolutely. Yes, go ahead. Yes, absolutely. There are people who are going to challenge you. They're going to support you. They're going to believe in you. And sometimes they're going to believe in you more than you believe in you. And that's what it takes to get it done. Um, I also say to people, let's say you're the one who has this great idea, right? So We've written down our three things that, we're, we're, that we complain about. We figure out one of them is really good. Like lots of people are impacted by this one thing and there are things that we can do about it. And you're not a leader. You're, you're, you're not the person who's going to go out there and do it. But you know the person who is. Go out there and find that person and tell them, hey, I need you. And I met many people like this, by the way. I need you to do this and I'm going to stand behind you all the way and you're going to be our leader and we're going to solve this problem together. You don't need to be alone. And a lot of people end up, you know, before they get to that trajectory where they can solve a problem where they're, they're alone and it's hard. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've certainly had uh, probably a lot more often this year than last year moments where I'll take a step back and I'm like, you know what? Right now I could give up. Mm -hmm. and, and this could be it. And much like you said, I could go home and I put in a good effort and I got halfway there and I should congratulate myself for that. And that's not good enough, <laughs> at least for me. I personally, I, I'm very fortunate to have kind of like the inner cheerleader to say that. Um, Yay! But having having that person there to do that uh, is extremely helpful. I mean, they're kind of like the voice of reason coming back in and saying, whoa what what's happening like yesterday everything was fine you were on it and now today you're just gonna give up and so I, I really i know what it's like to have that person there uh you know i've had coaches throughout my life whether it's been in sports uh whether it's been in business uh it, and they've really been the people who have just said you know what it doesn't stop here that's right. And I, I, I tell people, find that mentor, find that coach. And if you can't find it, reach out to me. I'll be your cheerleader. You call me up that day where you're having doubt. You send me your draft letter of resignation. And, and I'll look you in the eye and say, we're not done yet. Yeah, We're not done yet. That's, that's, that's what we have to do for each other. I, I also think, you know, we're, 
fortunately, we're moving forward from our huge economic crisis, right? We can see the light at the end of the tunnel. We can see that we're starting to build our economy again, and we're 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 turning. We've turned that corner. Um, but we, when we were going through that, you know what? We needed somebody every single day to say, "We can do this. We can make it through. We can take that one more step." You know. The, the old adage, success is one step beyond failure. The day that I wrote that letter of resignation and that I said to Michael, you know, I'm done. And he said to me, no, 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 we're not done yet. It was only three days later that I was reached out to by Oprah Radio to be interviewed by Maya Angelou. Wow. Three days. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> and and, and you, you, you couldn't see that dividing line between failure and success any more clearly. Yeah. Three I mean, days. And, and that interview with Maya Angelou didn't, didn't necessarily change the trajectory of my journey. I didn't all of a sudden raise all the money that I needed to, to get it done. I mean, that's, that wasn't our reality, but we weren't anymore the sound of one hand clapping. Yeah. And we needed to be able to tell the story and she gave us, she gave us a platform and it was amazing. That reminds me about this great video that uh, Gary Vaynerchuk put out at one point, uh, maybe a couple years back. And as you know, he's a little bit vulgar. Uh, he's a little he's bit good. interesting, but he's good. <laughs> and he put out this video that was called, what is the ROI? What is the return on investment of your mother? And Ooh. much like what you said there, you can't look back and say, because I had this one moment where, you know, I was on this interview with Maya Angelou that, you know, ABC happened later on. Gary kind of goes in and says, I can't tell you that in the third grade, you know, some kid in my class said I looked stupid and my mom told me that it would be OK. And that's the reason why, you know, here I am today, a multimillion dollar business owner. You know, he, you can't look back and, and correlate it. It just it doesn't work that way. But, you know, because that event happened in his life, that helped to shape who he is today. That's exactly right. And all of the, you know, you said before, you're a storyteller. Um, I consider myself a storyteller, too. I, w I, I want that to be my job title. I'm, I am a storyteller, and I teach people to tell their stories because through stories, we all, we all learn the best. But all of the pieces of our growing up are pieces of that story. So your mom supporting you through, a, you know, a bully's unkind words are, are part of what gave you the structure to be able to support your colleague through an abusive boss. I mean, you know, we, we can never see the direct connection, but they are all part of the story that makes us who we are. And everybody's story is fascinating. Every single, there is not a person, you know, when I was traveling the country, um, I would put it out on social media. I'm coming here and I'm coming there. Who are the people who are solving problems in your community? And it was very open-ended. I didn't want it to be about what I thought were issues. I just wanted it to be about, you know, who are the people that you think are solving problems in your community? You live there. I don't live there. And I didn't look at the, the nominations and say, yeah, this guy's interesting and this guy's not interesting. And I just followed the path because I know that there is nobody in the world that I, I, I mean, I dare you to find somebody that I can sit across from and, and not share a fascinating story about their life. And when you're asking for people who are solving problems, you know, I made a, a promise to myself and it was interesting. A woman who read my book recently uh, said, you know, I want to tell you what the most meaningful part about your book was. And I wrote in the book, and this is what impacted her, that for a solid year, I said not one negative thing. I was not looking for anything negative to say about our country. I was looking for every positive story I could possibly tell you. There is plenty of there are plenty of avenues for you to get negative news. You can, you know, you can troll social media and find all the, you know, troll communities and you can complain and 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 whine and badmouth all you want. But that wasn't what I was doing. I was going to go around the country and I was going to find you every single uplifting story that I possibly could find for a solid year. And I haven't stopped. You know, I have, um, I, I, I love social media and I fell in love with it during this year. I learned it for this year. I was, I'm a technophile, but somehow I got, I was late to the social media bandwagon. I really don't understand it, but whatever, I'll get over it. Through this year, I learned 
and fell in love with social media. And I have a very strong social media mission statement. And in short, it's changing the mirror we use that reflects who we are as a society. My job was to give you a different mirror to look at. And our, you know, our media, and I, there's a chapter in my book where I asked the question if my trouble getting media on this journey when, when others who did similar things that, you know, were, you know, not any that much different than what I was doing, they were getting this great media. And I'm like, why am I getting a hard time, having a hard time getting media? And I asked the question, did I badmouth media by saying, yeah, you want bad news? Just turn on the news and you're going to get your bad news. But it was the truth. And there are study after studies that, that the media agencies do that, you know, they try this good news stuff and nobody wants to hear it. Well, I think we're making our choices by ourselves now. How many people sit in front of the television every day uh, versus utilize Netflix, get, their, get their, their stories in chunks by the people they follow on social media, make very specific um, uh, decisions about who they follow and what content they're reading and absorbing. And that's all about changing the mirror. It's so funny to hear you say this because I went on a training last night and uh, this was just a training for Facebook and how to you know, just build a bigger following. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the slides, I just, I have a picture of it on my phone here, but it says people share content that represents the way that they want to be perceived. So a lot of the content that's going viral now are these super inspirational videos of people that are doing good in the world. People aren't sharing, you know, the, the pictures of, you know, the, the bodies washing up in, in, I think, is it Syria or Turkey in, in Turkey. And so people aren't necessarily sharing that nearly as often as they're sharing, you know, here's the, um, I just saw yesterday, it was a video. They took, uh, this couple that had been in a relationship and seven years later or something like that, they put them in a room and they had them ask each other questions about, you know, why did we break up? Where did we go wrong? What did we learn? And they like almost fell in love again over the video. And it's like that's getting shared virally because people want to relate to that that inspirational feeling. And so it's that's a huge thing that's going on right now with social media. It is, and we feed into it. If you look, um, if you look and explore your own your own postings, how many get likes? Right? Which content is it that everyone's excited about? It's the smile. It's the heartfelt quote. It's a story. It's the you know. And and there's this conversation. My big thing, and I train on social media storytelling in particular, and my big thing is authenticity, right? That's my number one word. And I say to people when they do workshops with me, if they come out with nothing else but the understanding that they need to be authentic, then I have done my, my good value in the world today. But if you look at the stories that are authentically shared about those happy moments and those loving moments and balance it with people saying, well, why nobody's kids are always that cute or always that happy or always that whatever you want to say about what people are posting I don't care I don't need to see the meltdown I have the meltdowns in my own house I don't need to you know experience your meltdown I'm happy to experience your beautiful first day of school picture I, even if that night there was a holy meltdown over I don't want to do homework I still want it to be summer you know it's okay to be sharing those things that lift us up because we're, we are looking for a community that lifts us up. We're not looking for a community that pulls us down. And social media really gives you that opportunity. I talk about, um, uh, there was an experience I had a number, number of years ago. Before I you know, quit my job and traveled the country, I did a training through a program called the White House Project. And the idea of the White House Project doesn't exist today. Was It was creating a pipeline. It was nonpartisan of women to run for office. I mean, that was the whole goal. And I met this young woman from Pakistan who was in the United States on a fellowship. And she did this training with us here in Denver. Um, and then, whatever, life goes on. And I get on social media. And she finds me. And so, yay, we're connected on social media. Fast forward five years and she's going through her second pregnancy. And she had had a horrific experience through her first pregnancy because where she lives in Pakistan, there was no Lamaz. There was no pain blocker medication for birth. Um, there was really no focus on the woman getting through the experience without trauma. And 
here comes Facebook and I'm able to send her Lamaze videos. I'm able to coach her through breathing. And I become a sister of this woman in Pakistan who I spent one week in training with. And, and then because of Facebook, we were brought back together in community. I think it's the most brilliant thing ever on the planet. And it has made our world so tiny. And that's the way it needs to be. Because guess what? There are pictures of kids who are washing up a float and they are Syrian children who are trying to get away and they're in Turkey and and you know what it matters to our world and it matters to us and while we may not be sharing that as much we're aware of it we know people who live in Turkey we can contact people who live in Turkey it doesn't cost us a, you know an arm and a leg to make a phone call over there if we have family who's abroad and it's because of social media. I think there's so much value in social media in building our community in the way that it needs to be built. And in changing the way, you know, our generation who has been involved in social media, my, my kids aren't on Facebook yet. They're, they're um, 13, 14, and 20. The 20 year old is on Facebook and he's been on Facebook for, for some time. But the 13 and the 14 year old, they're not so interested in it. They're mm. gonna find their other platforms. They're gonna be communicating on social media in their own way. But there's this expectation that they're gonna be connected to the world. Not where you know we came into it and it's like, oh my God, opportunity, opportunity. For them it's, well, of course I'm gonna be connected around the world. Of course I'm gonna see my cousins who live in the Middle East grow up and that's, you know, it's, it's an amazing, beautiful, brilliant thing. And you and I, we talk about travel. We're passionate about travel. Every time I open Facebook, I'm traveling. It, I'm traveling to Ohio. I'm traveling to New Jersey. I'm traveling to the Middle East every single day. It, it's actually exactly where I go when I'm making posts. I'll, you know, I'll check in at the airport and say something about it. Or, you know, I'm never, I don't think I'm ever really home when I'm posting. I'm always on the go doing something <laughs> when I post. And um, I, I'd be curious to see, you know, 10 years from now, what your kids are using to communicate. Because obviously it's, it's constantly changing. Um, part of me has kind of taken a guess and said that we might actually see things uh, reverse and come back to a more uh, personal one-on-one -on -one approach because I think that uh, with how many people are building their tribes back up and, and doing a lot more in-person meetings, uh, I wonder if, if that might come back. Uh, so we'll have to see what happens. But uh, just to round this all off because this is such a great conversation, out of all of your travels, out of you know hundreds of people that you've talked to, if there was just one thing that you could say to someone who wants to know how they can live the most meaningful life, uh, what would it be? Every single person that I interviewed, um, it, was, it was South Dakota that I had my kind of epiphany moment. And, um, and I, I learned a lot through this year. So I say this with all deference to the Native American community who were displaced. The pioneers did some things very, very right. They understood that in order to be successful, they not only had to plant their fields and build their barns, they had to help their neighbor plant their fields and build their barns, and then together they built the church and the schoolhouse. Today is no different. I not only have to build my business, but I have to help you build yours, and I have to be your, your, your customer, and you are my customer, and then together we build the community center. It is simple, it is basic, and it is one plus one equals two, and it is how we succeed in this country. I really believe that entrepreneurship, small business, that's where we're going as a society. It, it, it is a little bit of a shift. It got very exciting, all of the big business coming in. And now that big business has its platform, they're there. It's time for us to, to turn a little bit and start growing back to that mom and pop and that neighbor down the street and that kid who has that great business idea that turns into this global phenomenon called Facebook. We have to support each other and that's how our community grows. And every story that I, that I shared, that's the essence of it. And you can go, there are 500, there are 375 videos. I interviewed 500 people. Um, you can spend a lifetime watching all of these videos. And um, there's also the book that you can feel free to pick up called It Takes a Little Crazy to Make a Difference. And I hope that it will inspire you. I, I wrote it in a way that, that my goal, um, 
I, I, I wrote my story, but I hope that you read yours and that it inspires you to take control of what you want to do. And I, I extend that promise again. If you don't have a cheerleader in your life, call me. I'm easy to find. I'll be your cheerleader. <laughs> Perfect. And what's the best place to find you online, like website wise, or is there, um, you know, social media? What, what would you like people to contact you through? Yeah, they can totally find me on Facebook. I'm there. I, I probably hang out there the most, even though the Twitter is my favorite. But all of my um, social information, contact information, phone, email can be found on my website, which is DaphnaMichelsonJanae.com, D-A-F-N-A-M-I-C-H-A-E-L-S-O-N-J-E-N-E-T.com. Perfect. I, I have a name like that too, Zeph and Moses Blacksburg. <laughs> so I always have to spell it out for people. Right. <laughs> I love when you have to like call into the credit card companies and they're like, can I have your name to confirm the account? And I'm like, Zephan, Z-E-P-H-A-N, <laughs> you know, and I have to go through it. So. And then they say, well, what's your first name? Right. right. <laughs> like, nope, that's it. <laughs> yeah. That's my world. We're, we're, we're soulmates, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks so much for spending some time with me today. And, and I think everyone should go ahead and, and check out your book. And uh, so excited to see what you have coming up next. Yep. And I'm excited to follow your journeys as well. So here's to great adventures together. This episode of The Year of Purpose is brought to you by our brand new book, Life Rescripted. Find your purpose and design your dream life before the curtains close. If you want to be the first in line to receive a free digital copy from me, all you have to do is head on over to www.liferescriptedbook.com to find out more. I've discovered what I think is the world's most effective process to design your path in life. It'd be a shame if I didn't share it. In Life Rescripted, you will discover the number one strategy for determining your life purpose and how you can start a new path today the 5x life hack rule for accomplishing your dreams and designing your life on your own terms five times faster, the ultimate solution for fear and how you can leverage it right now to make this year your best year yet, and so much more. Reserve your spot in line to get a free copy at www.liferescriptedbook.com and I will see you in the next episode.